data using, using machine learning to investigate factors influencing PCNSL treatment outcomes. Primary central nervous system lymphoma, or PCNSL, is a type of non-Hodgkin lymphoma which originates from the lymph tissue of the brain or spinal cord. It is an aggressive form of cancer and can spread over to other parts of the CNS, including the eyes, the spine, and the meninges, but it is normally contained within the CNS. When working with patients, the first step includes the usage of brain scans, blood tests, and lumbar puncture, followed by stereotactic biopsy and histopathological analysis in order to confirm the diagnosis of PCNSL. When it comes to treatment of patients, physicians must first consider their medical history, looking at factors such as their age, tumor location, and whether they are immunocompromised. A treatment plan is then created with the first stage being the induction stage, which aims to reduce cancer to remission by using aggressive treatment and involves the patient receiving a combination of chemotherapy. Consolidation therapy follows this, aiming to eliminate any remaining cancer cells and prevent relapse. With the current treatment plans, there comes a number of problems. First, there is a high chance of relapse of PCNSL, with 36 to 67% of patients experiencing relapse. Additionally, 6 to 29% of patients experience a primary non-response to the induction therapy, meaning that the first line of treatment was ineffective. In these patients, there are poor survival outcomes. Another problem with PCNSL treatment is its lack of standardization. There is a lack of comprehensive studies published on PCNSL treatment, leading to a loss of standardization when it comes to patient care. Again, this may lead to potentially ineffective treatment plans and poor patient outcomes. So, we plan on using a machine learning approach to create a predictive tool. Machine learning tools are a type of artificial intelligence that can efficiently learn patterns from large training datasets to make future predictions. These types of deep learning methods have attracted considerable amounts of attention and research interest because they are able to process a large number of MRI scans with high efficacy and efficiency. In addition, machine learning approaches are more cost-effective and importantly are non-invasive to the patient. For our objectives, we hope to create a population-level database with radiogenomic and biomarker information on many different patients and use AI to extract patterns to stratify patients with PCNSL into prognostic subgroups. These subgroups, which we will call patient profiles, can then aid physicians in determining optimal treatment plans. We hope that our AI model will help standardize treatment for PCNSL and allow physicians to make a more informed decision. Our experiment has three aims. Our first aim is to pool retrospective data from several databases to create a large multi-center PCNSL research database. Our second aim is to validate a machine learning model to extract relevant features from imaging data. And our third aim is to feed the patient data into a second machine learning model to identify factors that affect their response to primary CNS lymphoma treatment. These factors will be used to develop patient profiles when uh, used to help predict patient responses to various treatments, allowing physicians to make more informed decisions when prescribing treatment. Before going into specifics, I would just like to provide a quick overview of our proposed methodology. We start with a diagnostic test, such as MRI and stereotactic biopsies that are performed on the patient. Then radiologists can use these scans that were obtained to label the ground truth of the tumor before being added to a database. The third step relates to our aim number one, colored in red, and involves combining data from multiple databases to create a multi-center registry of patient histories. Moving on to the fourth step, we focus on aim two, colored in green, where we create our first machine learning model to extract numerical relevant data from brain scans. We will then validate our machine learning model based on its specificity, dice score, and sensitivity. Lastly, we will use the numerical values generated from the first machine learning model in combination with existing patient data in our databases to feed into a second machine learning model, which will create patient profiles to predict patient responses to treatment. And this relates to our aim number three. So for our first aim, we'll reach out to these different centers and groups who previously published studies on PCNSL to create the largest analyzed cohort of patients, increasing the heterogeneity of the data so that we can draw conclusions that best represent the patient population that we're serving. We will include various types of MRI scans, which are common to the clinical workflow, and each tell us a different piece of the puzzle. 
to help us capture a holistic view of how the tumor affects each patient. Then for a specific aim too, we'll first recruit radiologists to label the ground truths of where the tumors are if that's not already present in the patient charts. We'll then adapt the two parallel cascaded UNET machine learning model to segment the tumors and extract relevant information that we'll want to analyze. These features listed below have been shown in previous literature to predict patient outcome in various types of brain cancers, so we want to see how that affects PCNSL outcomes. We'll implement a 75% and 25% training slash testing data split to verify that the model is producing accurate extraction. To verify that the model is segmenting the tumors correctly, we'll use the dice score analysis comparing the regions of interest identified by radiologists to what the machine learning model has predicted. We'll use a common workflow to calculate the apparent diffusion coefficient values. This tells us how the water diffuses through the brain tumor issue and has been shown to be a strong predictor of patient treatment outcomes in PCNSL. Then, as part of our last step, we'll adapt the similarity network fusion, a, a robust and novel machine learning model that has been shown to integrate different types of data to create prognostic subgroups and predict patient response to treatment in various types of cancer. Typical machine learning models can only analyze one type of data, but this novel model can integrate multimodal data, extracting a more holistic understanding of not only how each factor affects patient outcome, but also how these different data types are interconnected to influence how the patient responds to treatment. We'll evaluate patient response to treatment by their overall survival, and the data will be split into a 75%, again, 25% testing data to verify that the machine learning model is creating accurate prediction. We will also validate the model using the following metrics to measure the subtype homogeneity and evaluate the likelihood that our results are due to chance. In the picture to the right, it shows how the similar network fusion model works. Each color represents a different type of data, and we can see that the patients are clustered based on how they respond to their treatment, um, and this is defined as their overall survival in terms of months. In conclusion, our study can help us derive findings that will help inform new evidence-based treatment plans to optimize PCNSL patient outcomes. Our use of AI is cost-effective, time-effective, and non-invasive, and will lead to patient care that is both comprehensive and individualized. In the future, we hope to use our machine learning model to extend beyond just prognosis, but also assist physicians with the diagnosis of PCNSL. Additionally, we hope to apply this novel approach towards other treatment plans targeting different diseases in which there are similar problems to PCNSL in order to improve personalized medicine and patient outcomes. Thank you. If there is any questions, we would be happy to answer. Uh, judges, we'll start your five minutes now. Hello, it's Adriana here. Um, are you guys able to hear me okay? Yep, we can hear yep. you. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so, you. is it okay? Yeah. Oh, all right. Um, yes, thank you so much for your research idea uh, and your presentation this morning, Joy, uh, Angus, and Ryan. Uh, I really enjoyed reading your letter of intent through and I thought your presentation was really very interesting and, and actually really quite organized and understandable. Uh, I'm just curious what your backgrounds or areas of study are. Are you guys in um, medical science or computational science or where are you coming from? Yeah, so we're all in medical science at Western actually, and we're all doing an honor spec in physiology. Um, I have a little bit of background in like computational neuroimaging, but I haven't worked with machine learning models before. And Angus and Ryan, Angus is, would you like guys like to talk about your background a little bit? Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. So like Joy said, um, both we're all from medical sciences uh, in Western in our fourth year of undergraduate study. Uh, and we're all in the honor specialization physiology program. Um, I don't have any background in computational sciences or anything of the sort, but uh, it was very interesting to learn about when we were coming up with this research proposal. Yeah, similar to Angus, I'm also um, doing an honor specialization in physiology. I don't have a background in sort of 
uh, computer science and AI. However, I think that throughout this project, it was really interesting to learn more about it and really go with this idea because I think that it's very relevant to what's going to be uh, going on in the future and our possible treatment plans moving forward. Well, indeed, yeah, very, very interesting. I, I, uh, I had a couple of questions for you. I don't know how time permits, but um, I had going through your proposal more a big picture question, um, not about your project specifically. Actually, I have questions about your project specifically too, <laughs> um, but more relating to your team's thoughts on whether AI, machine learning, um, deep learning neural networks and this direction of data management will impact or intersect with the conduct of clinical trials. And that's typically how we learn about treatment outcomes. So do you, do you think AI models like this and big data are ultimately going to replace traditional clinical trials eventually? Will they complement them? Um, what, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, that's definitely something really interesting to think about big picture. In my personal opinion, I think that we're not at a stage in machine learning where it's gotten to a point where the generative AI is good enough to be able to replace actual real life scenarios. There's machine learnings, to my understanding, these models will take a huge amount of data and then they're really good at extracting the patterns from those data sets. But if we're looking at a novel type of treatment or doing something new that's never been done before, then I feel like with my current understanding of what they are, they're not sufficient to be able to tell us how patients might respond to these novel types of treatment. Because again, they're looking for data uh, patterns in the data previously. And if this is doing something new, then it's hard to use that past data to predict how patients might respond, if that makes sense. Yeah, adding on to what Joy said, um, in terms of answering your question, I do think that clinical trials will complement machine learning. So you can't necessarily have one without the other. Uh, machine learning will be very helpful in the future, but I don't believe that we're in a position where it can completely replace clinical trials anytime soon. Yes, hopefully AI isn't going to take away everyone's job. <laughs> Yeah, and as we, I think, mentioned a little bit in our presentation, like we needed the radiologist to help us label the ground truth, right? And that's like helping us reality check that these models aren't hallucinating or something. And so I think it'll take a lot of work to be able to get to a point where um, machine learning tools can be robustly integrated into clinical workflows and in medicine. But um, I think it'll be a good complement and not necessarily a replacement. Can you tell me what ground truth mean? Yeah. Oh, I think Sue is like, time's up. But really quickly, ground truth is like what is like correct, I guess, to like compare the machine learning model predictions to. So it's like making sure that they're doing the right thing. So if the radiologists say that the tumor is here, that's like objectively a way for us to like assess if the machine learning model is doing the right thing. But what if the ground truth is not true? What if the radiologist does something wrong? And so that's why we didn't have time to elaborate on this, but that's why it's important to recruit multiple raters and then have an average of their ratings to obtain a more ground truth, ground truth. Interesting but dilemma. Yes, it is. Um, I think in the past, I have a, like, my thesis project is kind of related, where it's like, you recruit a lot of readers, you find a ground truth, and then you, like, kind of compare the points between different um, scans. And yeah, so in the past, that's what I've done. It's like, just take the average of, like, different readers who have um, experience with neuroradiology, but if you have any other insights, we're happy to hear as well. Uh, time is up for questions. Sorry, it will help if I take myself off mute when I'm um, making the alarm go off. Um, but um, yeah, so Joe, I don't know if you have any follow-up to conclude there.
No, I, I just didn't know whether our Ryan had a question, but but you're right. We should stick with time. Yes, if we could, that'd be great. Um, and Ryan, you'll be first up at the next round. Um, so if I could get um, Shana, please, from Queens to um, pull your project up. And if I can get everyone while the questions are occurring um, that um, are presenting next to pull your screens up while the questions are being asked, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much, Shana. And whenever you guys are set, um, I will have you uh, begin. Hi, everyone. My name is Shayna Sharma, and these are my teammates, Orlin Chowdhury and Shrika Vijanla. Before we begin, we would like to thank the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada, as well as the Del Maestro family, for the opportunity to present today. We will be sharing our proposal on using machine learning to analyze circulating tumor DNA and determine treatment response to methotrexate and prognosis for patients with primary central nervous system lymphoma, or PCNSL. PCNSL is a cancer that begins in the lymphocytes surrounding the intracranial blood vessels and rarely spreads beyond the CNS. The backbone of induction treatment for PCNSL is high-dose methotrexate, or HDMTX, a chemotherapeutic agent that penetrates the blood-brain barrier. However, prognosis and treatment response to methotrexate are highly heterogeneous among patients, and the identification of patients at high risk for treatment failure is challenging. Recent research suggests that circulating tumor DNA, or ctDNA, can provide valuable insights into how a patient with PCNSL responds to HDMTX. ctDNA describes small DNA fragments released into the bloodstream by cancer cells as they die. Specific ctDNA features, such as mutations in genes associated with HDMTX sensitivity, can predict various HDMTX treatment and prognosis outcomes. Machine learning, or ML, is a viable approach for identifying these predictive factors that lead to varying clinical outcomes. ML allows computer systems to train upon large amounts of data with known features and outcome metrics to identify patterns and generate valid predictions pertaining to prognosis and treatment responses on unseen patient data. Improved biomarkers are needed to better stratify patients into risk groups and predict treatment response to HDMTX, as well as prognosis outcomes. Metrics include tumor growth, progression-free survival, PFS, which is the length of time that a patient lives with the disease, but it does not get worse, and overall survival, OS, which is the length of time from the date of diagnosis that patients survive. CTDNA as an indication of prognosis outcomes and survival has been explored in other cancers, but has yet to be elucidated in a diverse population of PCNSL patients treated with HDMTX. Our proposed machine learning model incorporates optimization measures to maximize metrics such as specificity, suggesting that therapeutic insights of ctDNA may be leveraged. Our hypothesis is that a model trained on ctDNA and clinical data will outperform a model that's only trained on clinical data, allowing for improved insight into prognosis and quality of life outcomes prior to making decisions regarding chemotherapy treatments. Our proposal has two specific aims. First, we want to test if our machine learning model trained upon ctDNA features can predict treatment outcomes with high accuracy and generalizability. And second, we will implement Shapley additive explanations, or SHAP figures during deployment, which are graphs that show the weight of each driving feature that the model used to make its prediction. Our aim is that ML will therefore be smoothly integrated into clinical workflow, such that patients, families, and clinicians are better able to interpret predictions. Our data will be collected from at least 100 patients from various institutions to allow for statistical power and to account for institutional differences in PCNSL treatment protocols. As a result, our model's inclusion and exclusion criteria seeks to represent the target patient population accurately. Adult patients with PCNSL treated with HDMTX treatment without having undergone other treatments such as radiotherapy will be included. Patients with other cancer diagnosis or missing ctDNA data will be excluded. These measures decrease the likelihood that the model overfits to our data, in which it accurately predicts our training data but does not generalize its predictions to unseen data. 
We will be collecting raw clinical data such as age, sex, race, comorbidities, performance status, response to methotrexate treatment as scored on the response evaluation criteria in solid tumors or the RESIST criteria, other chemotherapeutic agents used, OS, and PFS. CTDNA data, data collected includes sequencing technology used, CTDNA concentration, copy number alterations, which are extra or missing copies of genes, methylation patterns, which are gene patterns that are turned on and off, and fragment size, which are the sizes of DNA pieces that float in the bloodstream. Using this data, we'll build two machine learning models. Model 1 will be trained only on clinical data, and Model 2 will include both clinical data and CTDNA features. For both models, as part of pre-processing, data will be encoded, imputed, and split 70 to 30 with respect to the training and testing set that the model will use. For model two, given the large number of features that will be extracted from CTDNA, a statistical technique known as principal component analysis will be implemented to ensure that the model only incorporates features contributing to accurate prediction and discards irrelevant or redundant features. After pre-processing, tenfold cross-validation iterating upon the training and testing sets will occur, in which the data is divided into 10 parts, with the algorithm being trained and learning patterns from nine parts and testing on the remaining one-tenth. This process will be repeated 10 times to test the model on a new part of the data. Various models and sampling methods, such as deep serve and random survival forests, or oversampling and undersampling, will be implemented and evaluated by the F measure, which delineates the model's precision and recall. Precision is the proportion of all predictions that were actually correct, and recall is the proportion of, of all possible true positives that were identified. The top performing model and sampling method combination that minimizes class imbalance would therefore be identified using our methodology, mitigating an imbalanced model that might incorrectly predict certain classes, such as improved response to treatment and high OS, more often than other outcomes, such as poor response to HDMTX treatment and low OS due to there being missing data in the original training set. As part of evaluation, confusion matrix evaluation metrics, such as true and false positive and negative rates, will be obtained from the top performing model and sampler. The final ML model will be deployed on a clinical dashboard presenting OS, PFS, and resist patient predictions given the patient's data, alongside a SHAP bar graph depicting the model's driving features ordered from highest to lowest contribution to the final prediction. Our proposal hence addresses the need for treatment guidance and decision-making support early in the prognosis by leveraging insights from CTDNA through a liquid biopsy. Patients and families are hence better equipped to understand the potential risks of treatment and determine which options are best suited to their desired quality of life. Incorporating SHAP figures as part of deployment also amplifies informed decision-making by mitigating the difficult interpretability of ML models. Our proposal hence sets a foundation for refining prognostic tools that give rise to personalized treatment guidance. We thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I'll open the floor to the judges now. Ryan, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, no, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, as you guys may know that uh, liquid biopsy uh, is obviously being a, you know, a very active field in research as a way to kind of non, non-invasive or minimally invasively kind of track patients' response to treatments and also with diagnostics. So, you know, very timely uh, topic. Um, I have two quick methodological questions um, regarding your project. Um, the first one is, um, I just, I was wondering, you guys can explain again why you're excluding patients who've undergone um, radiation therapy. Um, and um, because I wonder if this would limit your population um, as you know, uh, radiation therapy is an important mainstay for uh, of treatment for these patients. And then the second question um, is, what's kind of your timeline of when you get the samples? Is it before methotrexate induction? Is it you know comparing to you know, with it uh, after treatment as well, or is it certain time frames like three months, six months, one year, et cetera? Um, if you'd be able to elaborate on that. Hi, thank you for your question. Um, I can take on that first question. Um, it's a very good point that you bring up. Um, we're looking to come up with results that are very accurate. And so we decided that focusing just on um, high dose methotrexate would be the best way to go with um, for that. Um, so incorporating other uh, 
treatments such as like radio radiation therapy, steroid therapy, immunotherapy um, may skew the result and bring in other confounding variables. Um, so although it does limit our population, our goal is to get accurate and uh, generalized results specifically for the high dose methotrexate um, population. Yeah, so to elaborate on that, um, high dose methotrexate is also typically used, as we found before radiotherapy in the treatment of PCNSL. So we also wanted to find uh, patients where in the context of our methodology, they would receive their liquid biopsy closer to diagnosis prior to receiving high dose methotrexate. Um, and so this allows for them to get a baseline level prior to receiving any treatment that might influence the level of CT DNA. And then the machine learning model would be able to evaluate the extent to which this might be indicative of future progno prognosis um, outcomes. Um, and so they would receive each, um, the liquid biopsy and the machine learning model would be implemented prior to receiving any sort of treatment or chemotherapy. When you say liquid biopsy, do you mean biopsy of CSF liquid or biopsy of blood liquid? Our proposal plans to take a biopsy of blood liquid um, and take the CT DNA features from there. And, and do we know, will we find circulating tumor DNA in a patient with primary CNS lymphoma, such as Barrett, the patient in the case study? Yes, so while um, there can be varying levels of CT DNA in the blood, our previous research has shown us that there are often concentrations of CT DNA that are detectable. And even if these percentages can be small sometimes, this would be something that is often consistent between patients and something that would inform our results. Thank you. Adriana? My question was similar um, in the line of thinking to yours, um, wondering if the source of CT DNA makes a difference. So I don't know what proportion of your patient base would have measurable circulating blood CT DNA, if it turned out to be negative, even by the most sensitive measures, would you then default and say, oh, this patient doesn't have measurable CT DNA in the blood, we'll get it from the CSF? And you know what that is, and, and is that the same? Is it the same in the blood and the CSF? So based on prior research, we did find that CSF and plasma level CT DNA led to similar um, specificity values in terms of detection. And they both have significant value in terms of the machine learning model and being able to predict treatment outcomes. Um, in the case, if a patient had very low detectable amounts or even um, like close to zero, given that there are next generation sequencing technologies that are able to even detect these differences, it would still be an indicator of prognosis to some extent. And it would still be saying something about that patient and their potential treatment outcomes in response to HDMTX. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, we now have, uh, Lucas, you have your presentation up from McMaster. So whenever you guys are set, if you would like to go ahead. Awesome. Good morning, everyone. We would like to thank the Del Maestro family and the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada for the opportunity to present today on our project titled AI Guided Molecular Analysis of the Ocular Proteome for Non-Invasive Diagnostic Approach in CNS Lymphoma. Now, just as a background, in our case, a 65-year-old man is diagnosed with primary central nervous system lymphoma, which is a primary intracranial tumor. This disease has a five-year survival rate of 30%. PCNSL affects the lymphatic system, the brain, spinal cord, and cerebrospinal fluid. The issue patients like Barrett face is that greater than 50% of CNS lymphoma patients relapse within just two years upon diagnoses. With such high levels of recurrence, there is a need for non-invasive diagnostics that detect recurrence without altering the patient's quality of life. 
Current diagnostic systems include brain and spinal MRIs, as well as brain and bone marrow biopsies. These current diagnostics are invasive and have a long recovery time. We hypothesize that in order to help Barrett, we must develop a non-invasive diagnostic device that will detect early recurrence of patients with PCNSL. Every three months, teardrop samples will be collected in a test strip and an AI trained model will see the device and be able to identify abnormalities within the patient's ocular proteome. Similar devices have been used for the detection of Parkinson's disease, and there have been studies showing PCNSL proteomic analysis, giving us a framework for our work. To get into our aims, we would like to perform cell surface ocular proteome analysis of CNS lymphoma patients in combination with prior proteomic screens to model a baseline of the tear proteome. We will use machine learning for interpretation and analysis of large pooled tiered proteome data sets for identification of novel biomarkers. And we will hopefully do a preclinical collaboration with a biotechnology company, Axum, to implement point of care testing for early detection of CNS lymphoma patients. We will now begin with our first aim to gain a baseline model of the tiered proteome for later analysis and its related methodologies. First, tear samples will be collected using a Schirmer strip. To prepare the samples for mass spectrometry, tear proteins will undergo extraction, purification, lipophilization, reconstitution in hydrochloric acid, and digestion. Next, peptide analysis will be done using a high-performance liquid chromatography mass spectrometry machine. The obtained data will be matched to a human protein database with protein qualification quantification based on characteristics of mass spectra data, such as signal intensity and peak area. To identify protein identity and composition, the data will also be analyzed for peptide spectrum matches. Artificial intelligence or AI will assist in this process, which we will discuss later. Next, to confirm and validate the mass spectrometry findings of pre-discovered and newly identified protein targets, direct ELISA will be employed. The tier samples will undergo preparation where each protein, such as the pre-discovered targets listed above, will be purified, diluted, and immobilized on microtiter plates, followed by the application of a blocking buffer. Next, the plates will be incubated with a protein-specific fluorescently conjugated antibody. This allows for the subsequent measurement using a fluorescence microplate reader of the plant's antibody-bound absorbance. The detection and quantification of antibodies correlates with protein abundance. This procedure will be repeated independently for each protein target identified for increased result reliability. Now that we have our proteomics data, AI approaches proteomics data analysis differently than traditional bioinformatics tools. Standard methods rely on fixed predefined algorithms that often require straightforward data for optimal results. However, these methods struggle with complex variabilities seen in cancer proteomics and are not designed to adapt to unpredictable disease patterns. AI, on the other hand, learns dynamically. It doesn't require fully pre-processed data, which is crucial when handling highly variable data sets like those from cancer patients. AI models continuously learn from new data, adjusting the variations in the proteome that fixed algorithms might miss. This adaptability allows AI to detect patterns that rigid algorithms might overlook. So why is this important? AI can extract deeper insights from proteomics data, identifying unique biomarkers or disease signatures that might otherwise be missed. This leads to more precise diagnostics, especially in complex diseases like CNS lymphoma, where patient data can vary significantly. Tier samples will be collected from 100 patients with CNS lymphoma and 100 healthy controls. Proteomics data will be extracted using mass spectrometry. We'll split the data set, allocate, allocating 70% for training and reserving 30% for validation. Depending on the task complexity, we'll either use random forest for classification or neural networks for deeper pattern recognition. Models will be trained on labeled data, such as tumor grade and location, to detect proteomic signatures associated with lymphoma stages. We will employ knowledge graphs to map relationships between proteins, genes, and clinical outcomes. The model will validate using the 30% test set, measuring its sensitivity, so true positive rate, and specificity, specificity the ability to avoid false positives for, for distinguishing recurrent, primary, and healthy tier proteomes. Finally, regarding AIM-3, the construction of a diagnostic device will be supported by the biomedical engineering company, Axim. Axim Bio Biotechnologies is a company focused on developing novel diagnostic and therapeutic solutions, particularly in the areas of ophthalmology, such as tear assays. 
The non-invasive teardrop proteome detector utilizes advanced biosensor technology, incorporating a specialized collector and microfluidic channels to optimize protein extraction. Proteins are detected in real time through an optical biosensor employing surface plasma resonance. Now for the hypothesized results. As we have seen, there is a need for accurate and personalized non-invasive early diagnostic tools due to the alarming recurrence rate of CNS lymphoma. By analyzing the ocular proteome using the axim assay, we will be able to create an ongoing screening protocol that can prevent reoccurrence. In tandem, AI-driven diagnostics will use extensive data sets to deliver accurate and unbiased medical diagnoses, enhancing decision-making and improving patient outcomes. Now, we have three key future goals. The first one is that expanding the ocular proteome research could identify novel biomarkers indicating CNS lymphoma recurrence, allowing for earlier detection and treatment before preclinical symptoms arise. For goal two, we can leverage AI and proteomic data to create individualized treatment plans based on each patient's unique molecular and clinical profile, optimizing the treatment outcomes. And goal three, we will create AI tools that automate routine screenings and make remote monitoring of CNS lymphoma feasible improving access to care, especially in underserved areas. So to wrap it up, in conclusion, Barrett was diagnosed with a primary central nervous system lymphoma. It's a condition that significantly lowers the quality of life for patients and has a high chance of recurrence. Our proposal stems off these observations as we employ non -invasive, a non-invasive diagnostic device using a trained AI guided model. This device will be able to identify abnormalities within the ocular proteome to detect potential relapses, improving clinical outcomes, not only for Barrett, but for future patients suffering from this unfortunate condition. Thank you for your time. Thank so, you. So my first question will be, why did you go with tears and not saliva or some other body fluid? Yeah, definitely. We wanted to find the most non-invasive way. So the standard um, diagnostic tool as of right now is a spinal lumbar tap, um, which still is considered to be non-invasive, but we wanted a, a point of care um, device that could be used at home or on the go. Um, it sort of stemmed from um, the idea of uh, an Oxford nanopore. So there's a company which is making um, a, a little device that you can put into your computer and that can show full, I think, GNA sequence uh, or DNA sequencing. So we thought that was really cool and we wanted to implement that with, with uh, our own design. So I think that's why we chose teardrop specifically. Um, like the CSF, teardrops also do express um, um, different levels, levels of concentration um, based on how your body is reacting spe to specific things. So I think that's why you went with this, this specific model. So I would argue that lumbar puncture is invasive. Um, I I don't think you'd want to be on the receiving end of one, but anyway, um, why the company Axum? How did you how did you find out about this? I'm looking at their website right now. They seem to be an eye disease related company. Is it is it just another bit of, of digging that you did, or? Yes, exactly. Um, they've they they're currently working on um, something like this as well, um, but for Huntington's disease or. And we thought it was pretty interesting that a company was doing something like this, but we wanted to integrate um, the use of AI as well um, to, you know, sort of make a more diagnostic or a more precise um, diagnostic device. So, um, yeah, that was just more digging that we did, um, looking for actual ways that we can implement our idea. Um, we wanted to give you guys more of the um, bigger picture and provide sort of like a a pipeline for future directions. So that's why we chose Axum specifically. Thank you, Adriana, Ryan. Oh, hi there, it's Adriana. Um, well, yeah, this is a pretty unique way of um, get, getting a biomarker, measuring a biomarker. Can you get CT DNA out of tears? That's a great question. Um, I don't know specifically. Um, I'd have to look into that a little bit more. Um, the main purpose of our proposal was specifically looking at just the um, tear proteome. So that was based off of different concentrations, which is shown through mass spec. I don't know if mass spec can um, distinguish CTDNA, but 
but it's definitely something that we can look into and it would be cool to implement that with the previous groups. Yeah, um, yeah I don't know if I've ever encountered tears as a as a body fluid for a biomarker. So kind of kind of kudos on that idea. I uh, I just wonder how you would scale that up. Uh, it's it's interesting. It's a um, you know I I don't know if we have time to delve into uh, you know how you would scale it if you if you ended up with good good results on your project. But I'll I'll leave it there. Um, sorry. Uh, if I could just add on to what Lucas was saying about the the CT DNA in the tears. Um, it's currently an ongoing study. Um, so it's like research is currently going on, but um, it has been detected in tears in some studies. Um, and there's also genetic material in some tears, so a little bit of both. However, um, as someone previously mentioned, like CT DNA is more prevalent in the blood. However, it's we can we can also get it in tears, which is really good because it's sort of like getting two birds with one stone. And we think that it's much more accessible as um you know, it's, it's a really non-invasive way to do it. Brian? Um, yeah, I, I don't know how much time we have left for questions, but um, obviously you you mentioned the two studies, I guess, looking at like, was it Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. Um, did they test like the specificity, sensitivity of that? And looking into, you know, how accurate it was to detect um, uh, the prevalence of those diseases in tears? Yeah, definitely. I know that um, those papers, their overall um, trial size was pretty low. I think it was 50 patients. So the specificity, whenever we were trained, whenever they were trained, their eye system wasn't too, too high. So the goal as of right now, um, we shared three different cohorts. So um, healthy donor, primary, and then recurrent. So that we would have a population size of about 300 patients, um, where we'd be taking um, samples every three weeks. So I think that would definitely increase the specificity for us as we're using the um, uh, an AI model, which can. Um, sorry, I'm hearing the alarm. The uh, we can yes, yeah, so we can use our AI model, which will obviously learn as it goes. So the more information that we provide it, um, the more specific that it'll um, become. So. Yeah, for those specific papers, the specificity wasn't as high as they expected, and their future directions was having a larger um, study cohort. So, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we've got another presentation. Um, Adrian, you've got the presentation up whenever your team is ready from Queens. Uh, the floor is all yours. All right, hi. Um, so my name is Adrian Jones and I'm here with my partner, Dylan Remington. Uh, we are here to present our proposal, uh, triple threat CAR T cells, uh, an experimental therapy for primary CNS lymphoma. Um, so primary CNS lymphoma or PCNSL is a rare diffuse large B cell lymphoma confined to the brain, spinal cord, leptomeninges and eyes. This cancer is infamous for its poor prognosis and limited treatment options, with 25% of patients unresponsive to chemotherapy and 50% of patients relapsing after an initial response. As shown in the left figure, the three-year survival rate is dismal at just 50%. What's more is that relapse rates are also higher in older patients like Barrett. Unfortunately, effective immunotherapies such as CAR T-cell therapy are essentially unavailable due to high levels of neurotoxicity, as shown in the figure on the right. Thus, there is an unmet need for safe and efficacious immunotherapies for PCNSL. Um, chimeric antigen receptor, or CAR T-cell therapy, has revolutionized the treatment of hematological cancers. So what is it? CAR T-cell therapy is a type of immunotherapy that uses genetically engineered T-cells to unleash the power of the adaptive immune system onto cancer cells. CARs encode a cancer antigen recognition domain that's linked to an intracellular signaling pathway. So when they bind a cancer antigen, the T cell becomes activated, allowing it to target and kill cancer cells selectively. It is effectively a living drug and it is manufactured in a patient specific manner. As seen in the figure, patient T cells are first collected via leukapheresis and a viral vector is inserted uh, or inserts the CAR gene, becoming CAR T cells. These cells are multiplied and infused back into the patient uh, where they express a cancer targeting CAR that gives them search and destroy anti-tumor function. 
Here's a closer look at the mechanism demonstrating how CAR T cells bind specifically to PCNSL cells, quickly inducing their apoptosis. Despite, as mentioned, despite remarkable efficacy, current CAR T-cell therapy is challenged by T-cell dysfunction and the immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment. Further, the application of CAR T-cell therapy to PCNSL is limited by neurotoxicity due to off-target effects and cytokine release syndrome. To address this, we propose engineering CAR T-cells to maximize anti-tumor function and safety. Our three aims to achieve this are, one, to enhance the anti-tumor function of CAR T-cells through genetic engineering, Two, to eliminate the neurotoxicity associated with gold standard anti-CD19 CAR T-cell therapy. And three, to improve the safety profile through lower CAR T-cell dosage. As a solution to these problems, we present to you triple threat CAR T-cells. These are CAR T-cells triple engineered to include the latest advancements in the field. Our CAR T-cells will employ, employ a novel anti-CD22 CAR, the breakthrough CAR11 PIK3 R3 transgene, and the validated PD1 knockout. We hypothesize that triple threat CAR T cells will have superior anti tumor function and less neurotoxicity than anti CD19 CAR T cells for PCNSL. We'll now analyze each of these threats. Threat number one is a novel anti CD22 CAR. In general, CAR T cells are designed to bind a single cancer associated antigen, which is generally proven efficacious. However, this can result in on target off tumor effects, uh, effects such as neurotox neurotoxicity to healthy cells that express the target antigen. The most common CAR antigen, CD19, is a transmembrane glycoprotein that is highly expressed in both healthy and cancerous B cells, but also CNS mural cells that help form the blood-brain barrier. Consequently, these cells are susceptible to attack by anti-CD19 CAR T cells, producing neurotoxicity through blood-brain barrier leakage and parasite depletion. And as shown on the top of the figure, this is a big problem if anti-CD19 CAR T cells are used to treat PCNSL. Alternatively, CD22 is a transmembrane glycoprotein uniquely expressed in only healthy and cancerous B cells, making it an ideal CAR target for PCNSL, as there will be no targeting of these CD19 positive CNS cells. Threat number two is the breakthrough CAR11 PIK3 R3 transgene. This transgene is a novel gene fusion that has taken the CAR T cell community by storm. Identified in a very recent Nature publication, CAR11 PIK3 R3, when inserted as a transgene, radically improves CAR T cell anti tumor function while maintaining an excellent safety profile. So, what makes this gene fusion so special? Well, this transgene boosts a key T cell activation pathway, increasing NF kappa B and AP1 signaling, as well as boosting IL2 secretion. The result is supercharged CAR T cells with superior persistence and tumor clearance compared to standard CAR T cells, as shown in the figures. Most importantly, CAR11 PIK3 R3 CAR T cells are extremely safe, requiring a hundredfold lower dose than standard CAR T cells with no toxicity in mouse models. While this has been implicated for solid tumors, we actually believe that this transgene is ideal for PCNSL therapies. Threat number three is the validated PD1 knockout. Immunosuppression has always challenged CAR T cell therapy due to inhibitory proteins such as PD1. PD1 is expressed on T cells and it functions to help keep the body's immune response in check. When bound to its ligand PDL1, it prevents T cells from killing other cells, which includes cancer cells, as shown in the figure. This pathway is actually considered the major mechanism by which cancer cells evade CAR T cells. Therefore, PD PD1 is an excellent target for gene knockout and one that has seen success in many therapies. Adenine base editors enable highly efficient AT to GC conversions without creating genotoxic double strand breaks. These adenine base editors can thus be used to disrupt PDCD1 splice sites carefully knocking out PD-1 without genotoxicity and helping overcome CAR T-cell dysfunction as shown in the figure. Now that we have discussed each of the three threats, let's get into the methodology. To produce our triple threat CAR T-cells, we need to electroporate primary human T-cells with lentiviruses encoding the CAR-11 PIT3R3 transgene and the anti-CD22 CAR, as well as plasmids encoding the base editor and a splice site disrupting guide RNA. Afterwards, we will confirm CD22 expression and PD-1 knockout via flow cytometry. And then as a control, we will produce anti-CD19 CAR T cells in the same manner. Our goal is to inform a clinical trial for Barrett and other PCNSL patients. So preclinical cellular and animal studies must be conducted. First, we will co-culture both types of CAR T cells with a diffuse large B cell lymphoma cell line. We will be assaying for cytotoxicity, proliferation, activation, and cytokines for preliminary in vitro evaluation. Next, we will generate a patient-derived xenograft mouse model of PCNSL 
in order to assess the safety and efficacy of our CAR T cells in vivo using 10 animals for each therapy. The injected cancer cells will be luciferase positive to enable tumor imaging. Surgically, the final CAR T cell cultures will be injected into the lateral ventricles of the brain through use of an intraventricular catheter and Omaya reservoir. CAR T cells will traffic through the CSF without crossing the blood-brain barrier, targeting all CD22 positive or CD19 positive B cells in the CNS. Specifically, we will inject only 20,000 triple threat CAR T cells versus 2 million anti-CD19 CAR T cells to highlight the potency of our triple threat CAR T cells. And then to assess anti-tumor function, we will measure tumor burden via imaging and animal survival. Animals will also be monitored for weight loss, indicative of neurotoxicity, and statistical analysis will be implemented. Triple threat CAR T cells can make immunotherapy a real option for PCNSL patients like Barrett. These cells should perform markedly better than current CAR T cell options, demonstrating superior anti-tumor function as well as an upgraded safety profile, and the required dose will be 100-fold less than the current gold standard, producing negligible side effects. Thus, neurotoxicity and cytokine release syndrome would be virtually non-existent in these patients. Lastly, this technology would lay the groundwork for future clinical trials in this domain, opening horizons for genetic engineering and other types of immune cells. Here are references, and thank you for listening. Thank you. Judges? So just so I, I understand, I think you guys are getting, uh, you're going beyond what's sort of current. I, it, so CAR T cell therapy for primary CNS lymphoma, is it being done now? You're just improving upon it? Is that, did I catch that correctly? Yeah, so uh, it has been done. There's current studies using these uh, anti-CD19 CAR T cells, which is sort of the standard of care for CAR T cell therapy. But um, while it has shown some efficacy, the main problem is that neurotoxicity with those uh, CD19 positive cells in the blood-brain barrier. Um, so this has kind of limited it as a real option. Like there's been experimental trials, but it's really immunotherapy isn't really considered a standard of care for these CNS cancers yet. And that's kind of what we hope to achieve with our uh, three different threats, especially the new CD22 car that uh, isn't going to target these CNS cells. So is is the more um, standard, as you call it, CAR T cell therapy, is that what's used for B cell lymphoma? Yes. So yeah, CAR T is sort of uh, what has actually revolutionized these B cell cancers. Um, yeah, it's a super good option for B cell cancers. And um yeah, it's, it's, the goal is sort of to expand CAR T to all cancers, especially these solid cancers and uh, other cancers like CNS cancers where neurotoxicity is a problem. And I assume that cytokine release, is it cytokine release syndrome or something like that? Is that like yeah. a side effect? That's kind of the main side effect, because if you're injecting a patient with a bunch of these activated T cells that are super active, they're releasing all these cytokines, there's going to be off target effects associated with that. So that's what we're hoping to achieve with the lower dose. Thanks, Adriana, Ryan. Yeah, no, great presentation. Um, so in what you've looked at with the studies looking into or uh, CAR-T therapy for uh, lymphoma, um, are they using this as an adjunct to like methotrexate radiation or is it kind of like an upfront thing? Where do you see your therapy, hopefully in that uh, treatment uh, paradigm. So what I've currently seen it is more for relapse or refractory patients that have undergone chemo, undergone radiation, and just nothing's all, nothing's working, the disease is still progressing. Uh, that's kind of where CAR T cell stands right now is sort of that last option. Um, so yeah, I guess sort of the kind of patient cohort for a clinical trial would be those uh, relapse patients. Adriana, I don't know if you have any questions. I don't know how much time is left on questions. I'm sorry. We have two one, minutes still. One to two minutes, yeah. Oh. A quickie. Oh, okay. A quickie. Yeah, yeah. I I think this next generation CAR T cell um, potential treatment is, uh, is a great idea. You know, it builds on other work creatively. So 
Uh, I mean, that's what good research should do. So I, I commend you on, on that idea. Uh, I think my, my understanding of this is that it is useful in hematological cancers, but but uh, primary CNS lymphoma is a solid tumor. And so I think there's going to be a challenge there in the delivery. I know you're using an Omeyer reservoir and it's circulating in the CSF, but you know how do you actually deliver it to the, the tumor mass itself? I, I think that's going to be a challenge. Um, yeah, so the idea is because even for solid tumors, you're still administering the CAR T cells systemically. And the idea is that they're going to use that uh, that CAR to sort of traffic to these tumor cells. And then another thing is with the PD-1 knockout, because these solid tumor masses have that super immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment, uh, by uh, knocking out these inhibitory receptors, we're hoping that we could penetrate that more. Okay, thanks. Sorry, if Sorry. I could add one last thing quickly. Um, sort of just echoing here. Um, yeah, so essentially with that PD-1 knockout, these new engineered CAR T cells should be able to just infiltrate right into the solid tumors like we haven't seen before. And so there has been some evidence of this being used in hematological cancer so far. Um, and so we're just hoping to combine a few things that have seemed promising into one solution that should hopefully take care of PCNSL. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Excellent. Uh, we now have uh, University of Toronto. Um, Alice, you've got your presentation up and whenever your team is set, you can start. Hello, my name is Alice and my colleague's name is Eleanor, and I will be proposing a innovative, uh, and we will be proposing an innovative and non-invasive therapy for primary CNS lymphoma, the use of linitamide coated iron oxide nanoparticles. Before we dive in, we'd like to extend our heartfelt thanks to the Pam and Ronaldo Del Maestro family for making this presentation possible, and to the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada for their relentless effort in raising awareness across the country. CNS lymphoma is a rare form of cancer that infiltrates all parts of the CNS. The median survival of patients with primary CS CNS lymphoma is 10 to 18 months. Surgery is not favorable due to the lymphoma's infiltrative nature and microscopic seedlings that remain after the surgery. The primary standard treatment for CNS lymphoma is high-dose methotrexate, which one, has substantial systemic toxicity, two, is not very selective in targeting tumor cells, and three, only penetrates about 5% of the blood-brain barrier. On top of not being very effective, these side effects are debilitating, with one review finding that 22 of 35 studies they looked at found that patients exhibited grades 3 to 4 toxicity, indicating that um, effects are potentially life-threatening. Furthermore, Barrett's older age complicates ma matters further. Despite extensive research into primary CNS lymphoma, median survival in elderly populations are only in the six to seven months range. Furthermore, cortical steroids, commonly used drugs that manage side effects of chemotherapy, are less commonly used due to their exacerbation of pre existing conditions. Due to the severity of these side effects, many older patients like Barrett cannot tolerate these therapies. While diagnostic technologies have made incredible progress in the past couple of years, treatment for brain tumors are still lagging, especially for older patients. Today, we believe that we need a therapy that not only kills cancer cells, but also has fewer damaging side effects. Therefore, we propose the use of novel nanotechnology to improve Barrett's prognosis, a novel combination of iron oxide nanoparticles with a linalidomide methotroxate coating. Nanoparticles are defined to be chemical structures ranging from 1 to 100 nanometers in diameter. They are small enough to bypass the blood-brain barrier and deliver drugs straight to the cancer cell without losing any of the drug on the way. In many ongoing experimental trials, iron oxide nanoparticles are chosen due to their relatively easy and inexpensive synthesis and great potential as an anti-cancer drug. As an immunomodulator, linalidomide stimulates the body's immune system so attack, so to attack cancer cells and inhibit tumor cell proliferation. Iron oxide nanoparticles act as donors of free radicals within the cancer cell, which also induces cancer cell death, delaying further progression of cancer in recurrent and relapsed primary CNS lymphoma patients, the latter of which standard methotrexate therapy does not achieve. 
The combined properties of lenalidomide, moderate doses of methotrexate, and iron oxide nanoparticles make this treatment highly effective, as seen within recent studies. We propose the use of intranasal chemotherapy to effectively bypass the blood-brain barrier, a major challenge in treating primary CNS lymphoma. Within this method, analogous to earlier studies, a spray containing iron oxide nanoparticles coated with lenalidomide and methotrexate will be delivered directly into the nasal cavity. The nanoparticles will travel along the olfactory and trigeminal nerves, allowing them to reach the brain without entering the systemic circulation or passing through the liver, thereby avoiding first-pass metabolism and reducing systemic toxicity. This approach minimizes the risk of neurotoxicity and infections associated with more inv invasive delivery methods. Due to their small size, the nanoparticles can penetrate the tight junctions of the blood-brain barrier and directly reach the tumor cells. Once inside the cancer cells, the nanoparticles will release their therapeutic agents. Within our study, our key objectives are, one, to minimize grade two toxicity side effects and prevent toxicity sym symptoms of grades three and higher through the use of nanoparticles, and two, assess the impact of novel treatment on tumor size. Our trials will begin with determining the effectiveness of the proposed treatment using mouse models and monitoring the tumor size post treatment. If the results are promising, clinical testing will begin in three phases. Determining dose, testing on a small population sample, and finally, a larger population sample with more demographics. We hypothesize that the use of lenalidomide and methotrexate in conjunction with iron oxide nanoparticles will decrease the growth rate and size of the tumor, as well as decrease severe symptoms that lower quality of patient life. Within the preclinical phase, we will conduct an experiment using mice to compare the efficacy of different treatments for primary CNS lymphoma. The first group serving as our control will receive standard methotrexate treatment to establish a baseline for our tumor reduction and toxicity. The second group will be treated with a combination of methotrexate-coated iron oxide nanoparticles to observe the targeted approach. The third and fourth groups will be individually treated with a standard delivery of linalidomide and methotrexate-coated iron oxide nanoparticles, respectively, to determine the isolated effects of both treatments. Tumor growth, brain damage, and side effects will be carefully monitored across all groups to assess the impact of each treatment approach. Clinical testing will proceed in multiple phases, beginning with phase one, where a small group of patients are intensively monitored for symptoms throughout the cycle, refining dose-limiting toxicity um, and dosage for this combination of medication. Phase two will focus on determining the occurrence of grade two and above toxicities, monitoring for potentially life-threatening side effects such as neurotoxicity, organ damage, or severe systemic reactions. Finally, phase three will evaluate the safety and efficacy of the proposed treatment on a large sample size, up to 1,000 participants, allowing for um, so around 1,000, um, allowing for better understandings of how different demographics, such as older adults, can tolerate these therapies. According to the clinical study conducted within the last few years, we are estimated optimal dosages for len lenalidomide uh, to be around 5 milligrams per kilogram of the patient's body mass, iron oxide nanoparticles to be 5, uh, five, milliliters per milli uh, 5 milligrams per milliliter of nasal spray, and for methotroxate, uh, 5 milligrams per kilogram of body mass. We also predict that the short-term reductions in tumor size go as far as 50%. Nanoparticle treatment offers several key benefits in treating primary CS CNS lymphoma by delivering drugs directly to the tumor with precision. It reduces tumor growth more effectively, minimizes damages to surrounding brain areas, and allows patients to retain cognitive and motor functions, something current therapies do not have. The less invasive nature of these nanoparticle-based chemotherapies is partially ben uh, particularly beneficial for older adults and chronically ill patients who may struggle to tolerate these traditional therapies. This targeted approach is also expected to improve patient psychological well-being and enhance their overall quality of life throughout the treatment. Here are our references. Thank you for your attention, and we are excited to answer any questions now. Thank you very much. Judges? I don't know, Adriana or Ryan, you want to start or? Uh, hi, hi, it's Adriana. Hi, um, Alice and Elena. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I really enjoyed reading your letter um, and thought your presentation was very interesting too. Um, I, my question, I think, really relates to the nanoparticles, like the iron, the iron oxide. Does that accumulate in the body? I, I know you're trying to get it specifically to the brain, but does it distribute elsewhere in the body? Um, 
is there any negative effect of that? And also, can it affect MRI imaging or introduce artifact as you want to follow these patients? Because my understanding is that iron oxides can also be used as an alternative MRI contrast agent to gadolinium. Uh, so can that obscure following a patient with MRI? Um, I can definitely take all of that. So for us, um, while there have been concerns about nanoparticle toxicity within the past, due to our low concentrations and targeted approach through the olfactory nerves, um, there, the studies do suggest that most of the nanoparticles do kind of come within the brain and specifically will target the brain uh, tumors. The precise targeting is more so done through the um, actual drugs that the nanoparticle is coated in. I believe um, lenalidomide um, and both methotrexate actually both um, are kind of uh, responsive to some of the proteins on the tumor itself. So I believe methotroxate, for example, um, it specifically kind of binds to the folic acid um, receptors on the on the actual cancer cell, which cancer cells have more of as they have a higher consumption of folic acid. In terms of the overall um, toxicity and kind of getting rid of the nanoparticles within um, studies, it is suggested that the nanoparticles ultimately exit the patient's body within um, a week. This is uh, confirmed by studies done across uh, you know mammals and humans alike uh, that they will exit out through like the usual methods uh, with waste um and um in terms of uh, the toxicity it's actually suggested that iron oxide particles um the toxicity the potential toxicity of iron oxide particles is outweighed by the fact that they are also a potential anti-cancer treatment uh so since they the, the the approach would be kind of targeted the um particles would um only kind of target cancer cells and not damage any of the other neural tissue oh and sorry i will address the mri too so uh yes it, iron oxide has been uh, used as um, specifically supermagnetic iron oxide nanoparticles. They have kind of been used uh, within MRI uh, and they, um, I believe that it's actually a, a prominent method um, that is being studied right now that to kind of like damage, uh, image the um, tumor tissues specifically as um, these nanoparticles will congregate within large tumor tissues. Um, so I think it would it's overall beneficial as it would kind of uh, be simultaneously a treatment and while allowing um, kind of better viewing of the tumor through methods such as MRI. Thanks, Brian. Your... Oh, sorry, Adrian. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. No. Great presentation. Uh, have any other studies looked at? Um, uh, um, kind of the delivery method that you propose, like through the nose intranasally. Yes, um, there have been studies with um, other nanoparticles. There have been studies with, um, I believe, like lenalidomide alone. Um, and uh, once again, there does seem to be um, a greater uh, kind of, uh, first of all, access to the brain when, uh, you know, uh, it's done intranasally rather through like more invasive methods um, that would require like surgical involvement. Um, so yes, analogous studies with nanoparticles have been complete in uh, humans, in mammals, and in monkeys alike, I believe. Um, just along those lines, um, so so I yes, it's a very ambitious project with multiple parts. Um, I was looking at your slide of the, um, I think the preclinical model, I think you called it. And there looked like some kind of, was it a rodent there that mm -hmm. was in it was that? A mouse. It was mm -hmm. a mouse. Mm -hmm. and I'm just curious, how, how do you get um, a mouse? How do you inject a mouse intranasally? Do you like, do you just grab it? And they're, they're pretty tiny. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've I'm worked sorry. with, I've worked with rats. They're, they're a bit bigger. Um, so have people done this before injecting mice intranasally? Mm -hmm. So um, particularly with mice, they have a lot more, like a higher concentration of blood vessels within their nose. Um, yes. So um, you could actually inject, uh, like spray them with a lot less so that they get similar effects. Uh, furthermore, since they are, um, they have a unimodal um, like breathing system in which like humans can breathe through their mouths, but um, rodents can only breathe through their nose. So um, due to that, most of the um, airflow and um, 
like essentially there's a lot more um, going into their nose. So more will enter through the nose rather than in humans where it's dispersed between uh, mouth and nose. Essentially what I'm um, getting to here is that um, you can have a lot lower concentrations of these particles to have similar effects in humans. So, so just spray some into their cage and it's gonna go in their nose pretty much. Um, ideally aiming towards their nose, but okay. Yes, All right, thank you. I think we're out of time, Sue. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and the last team, um, also from Queens, um, Ali, you've got your presentation up and whenever your team is set, uh, the floor is all yours. All right. Hello, my name is Azam Mansouri, and these are my colleagues Adil Huck and Ali Amjad. We wanted to thank the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada and the Del Maestro family for giving us the opportunity to present today. We will be discussing how biomimetic AMD 3100 SPNP nanoparticles can be utilized to enhance the treatment of primary central nervous system lymphoma, or PCNSL. <clears throat> As you may know, primary central nervous system lymphoma is a rare and aggressive type of non-Hodgkin lymphoma that originates in the central nervous system. One of the major challenges in treating PCNSL is the blood-brain barrier, a protective shield around the brain that prevents harmful substances from entering, but also makes it difficult for medicines to reach brain tumors. As seen in the diagram, the current gold standard treatment, high-dose methotrexate, HDMTX, faces this very issue, with only about 5% of the drug penetrating the blood-brain barrier to reach the tumor. This limited penetration requires high doses, leading, sub leading to suboptimal treatment outcomes and a high rate of tumor recurrence, with nearly 50% of patients relapsing within two years. There is a need for effective strategies to deliver therapeutic agents across the blood-brain barrier, targeting the tumor microenvironment to prevent relapse and improve treatment outcomes. Recent advancements in nanotechnology have introduced biomimetic nanoparticles, which are nanoparticles designed to mimic natural biological structures. As seen in the diagram, these nanoparticles have shown great promise in crossing biological barriers like the blood-brain barrier and delivering, delivering therapeutic agents directly to brain tumors. Studies have demonstrated that these nanoparticles can reduce systemic drug exposure, minimize toxicity, and enhance treatment efficacy. For example, Tyloski et al. demonstrated that fucoidin-based nanocarriers, which are natural substances converted into delivery vehicles, successfully transported a drug called Vismodegib across the blood-brain barrier. This treatment was specifically aimed at medulloblastoma, which is a type of brain tumor, and proved to be highly effective. Similarly, Algamria al. studied a different type of nanoparticle, AMD3100 SPNP, which targets the CXCR4 pathway in glioblastoma multiform, another type of aggressive brain tumor. Their findings concluded that AMD3100 SPNPs could block a critical signaling pathway between cells in both laboratory cultured cells and actual mouse models. This led to increased tumor cell death and immunologic memory. Our proposal centers on AMD3100 SPNP nanoparticles. Several studies show AMD3100 SPNP demonstrate enhanced ability to cross the blood-brain barrier. This ensures that a higher concentration of the drug reaches a tumor site, which would allow for better treatment outcomes. As mentioned previously, al Ghamri et al. demonstrated the effectiveness of AMD3100 in glioblastoma multiform, a different CNS cancer, where it successfully inhibited the CXCR4 pathway. Recent research by Montesinos, Ranjan et al. and Hemming et al. has revealed that primary CNS lymphoma also utilizes the CXCR4 pathway. This convergence of findings highlights the potential of AMD3100 in treating primary CNS lymphoma. In addition to this, studies show AMD3100 SPNPs establish immunological memory within the central nervous system, promoting a sustained immune response that prevents tumor recurrence. This represents a significant advantage over traditional treatments like high-dose methotrexate, which lacks this capability. Thus, we hypothesize that AMD3100 SPNPs will be more efficacious than the gold standard drug HDMTX due to three reasons. One, it crosses the blood-brain barrier more effectively. Two, it establishes immunologic memory, preventing tumor recurrence. And three, it has effectively treated other CNS cancers. Through our experimental methodology, we hope to, number one, assess the efficacy of AMD3100 SPMPs versus HDMTX in vivo by comparing tumor size reduction and time to regression. And two, 
we want to compare tumor recurrence rates by assessing recurrence-free and overall survival. To achieve our research goals, our methodology is structured into three key steps outlined in this timeline of events. First, we'll begin by acquiring the AMD3100 SPNP nanoparticles as per the protocol in El Gamri et al., along with 40 mouse models of PCNSL. These will be divided into two groups. The experimental group of 20 mice will receive the nanoparticles, while the control group will receive the conventional treatment, idos methotrexate. Treatment will be administered over a six-week period with consistent monitoring to ensure proper dosage. Next, we will use MRI imaging to track the progression of tumor size. Baseline MRI scans will be conducted at the start, followed by biweekly scans to monitor changes. The analysis will focus on tumor size reduction and time to regression, utilizing Kaplan-Meier curves to assess statistical significance and time to event analysis for understanding how quickly the tumors are responding to the treatment. Finally, we will conduct survival and recurrence analysis. This step will assess both recurrence-free and overall survival rates between the two groups. Again, we'll rely on the Kaplan-Meier estimator and the log rank test to compare the results and determine whether the nanoparticles have a significant advantage in reducing tumor recurrence and improving long-term survival. Our research focuses on advancing drug delivery systems for CNS cancer treatment, addressing key challenges in the field. One of the primary hurdles is crossing the blood-brain barrier while minimizing systemic toxicity. Current treatments struggle to effectively deliver therapeutic agents to the brain, and our approach uses biomimetic nanoparticles could change that. By enhancing the ability of these nanoparticles to cross the blood-brain barrier, we aim to improve drug delivery directly to tumor cells, reducing the negative effects on the rest of the body. Another important aspect of our study is clinical translation. Our goal is to develop these nanoparticles into a viable treatment option that surpasses existing therapies like high-dose methotrexate. We anticipate that these nanoparticles will reduce tumor growth and recurrence more effectively, leading to prolonged survival in the PCNSL model. This is a critical step towards more personalized and effective treatment for patients. Finally, this re research has the potential to extend beyond PCNSL. If successful, our nanoparticle approach could be adapted for use in other brain tumors, such as gliomas or metastatic tumors, offering broader implications for CNS cancer treatment. By overcoming drug delivery challenges and reducing recurrence rates, this study could have far-reaching impacts in the field of neuro-oncology. That concludes our presentation. Uh, thank you for your time, and we'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Judges? So your nanoparticle drug delivery uh, system, could it take other drugs into the target, or... Is it like not specific for the drug you're using or? I can take this question. Um, so the specific nanoparticle that we're using is AMD 3100. And the drug delivery system is the SPNP, which is a synthetic protein nanoparticle system. Um, Al-Ghamri et al. utilized this exact um, nanoparticle combination to achieve um, a decreased tumor occurrence and increased efficacy against glioblastoma multiform. So it, if we were to use this uh, nanoparticle system in other uh, gliomas, it would require that they utilize the same uh, chemical pathway, which is the CXCR4, CXCL12 pathway. And and you, you inject this into the bloodstream. This is not nasally administered. That's correct. This is through IV. Okay. Thank you. Adriana, Ryan. Question for you guys. Um, I think that this is a, you know, like a very interesting uh, drug delivery mechanism as a, as a nanoparticle. I thought proteins were rather large, so I'm assuming that these are all below these that, all below that. Uh, 100 uh, nanometer size or or whatever to to gain access. Um, so how how stable are protein carriers anyway? Or are, are proteins pro aren't they prone to becoming denatured or degraded? If if a patient were to receive this, would, would this have to be made up and given? on the same day, I like how, how well do, does the carrier actually work? 
Um, and how long does the carrier hang around when it's administered to the patient? It, it sounds like there's a great advantage over other things because it is biodegradable, um, you know, in terms of things like iron-based and such. But uh, I, I just wonder about using a protein as a carrier, like will it actually cross the blood-brain barrier? Um, and is it stable? Um, and if it didn't work, could you use a different nano carrier for your AMD 3100 even? Yeah, uh, I can take this question. Um, so essentially it is a nanoparticle, so it is very small. So although it is a protein, it is able to cross the blood brain barrier. And this has been proven in in vitro studies and in vivo studies in other mouse models where um, this exact nanoparticle was utilized in uh, mice and in vitro to treat a different CNS tumor. Uh, so to answer the question of whether it would cross the blood-brain barrier, it shows um, increased effectiveness in crossing the BBB. Uh, in terms of how long the effect continues to uh, occur, since it does become degraded, um, AMD3100 is actually uh, an immunotherapy. So it, um, essentially inhibits the CXCLR4 pathway. And uh, this pathway is essential for um, myeloid immunosuppressive cells to uh, proliferate and activate. And these myeloid cells essentially um, increase tumor aggression and really cause a lot of damage within uh, living bodies. So by inactivating this pathway, um, T cells are able to um, recuperate almost and attack the tumors through the body's own immune system. And the best part about this uh, therapy is that it establishes immunologic memory. So even once the AMD 3100 is degraded, there is that uh, immunologic memory there to um, ensure that tumor that tumors do not continue to grow. Uh, Al-Ghamri et al. actually showed that 60% of glioblastoma multiform tumor-bearing mice remain tumor-free after re-challenging with a second uh, glioblastoma multiform in the contralateral hemisphere. So the sustained anti-cancer um, immunological memory response that prevents tumor recurrence is a really uh, significant advantage over traditional therapies. Um, to sort of add onto Adil's answer as well, um, essentially, like our nanoparticle is utilizing two effects. So um, the first effect is uh, the enhanced permeability and retention effect, which essentially allows small particles like nanoparticles to accumulate um, at the tumor site of uh, solid tumors. And on top of that, with our nanoparticle, it's specifically engineered to bind to the specific pathway. So uh, this also allows for active targeting at the same time as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone for all of your great presentations. Um, I'm always um, absolutely impressed with um, what everyone's um, come up with and uh, the answers to your questions. So thank you for taking the time. Um, we will now um, have um, Sabra present. Um, Sabra, while well, you're getting things, um, oh, everyone's changing here. Hold on. Where are you? Perfect. Um, so that you can pull up your slides. Um, and once Sabra gets started, I will open the breakout um, room for the judges to deliberate. Yes, who <clears throat> ended up getting sick and not making slides. So it's just going to be a topic no of discussion. But No uh, problem. Yeah. Whenever you're set, Sabra, go ahead. Okay, sounds good. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Sabra. I am uh, currently a fourth year medical student at Queen's. Uh, I have worked, uh, well, I have been involved in different ways with the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada for almost seven years now. Um, when I was an undergrad, uh, very, very similarly in your position. So uh, Susan and, and the Brain Tumor Foundation to, uh, team uh, invited me to uh, to speak a little bit about uh, some of my experiences and, and uh, my academic journey uh, to where I am now. Uh, so very happy uh, to uh, to sort of discuss uh, some of the things that I've been involved in and, and how 
um, that's sort of taken me uh, across my uh, academic uh, career. Uh, and I'm also very happy, of course, at the end to answer uh, any questions um, or, you know, any pieces of advice, whatever it is. Uh, and I can share my contact at the end if anybody uh, would like to, um, you know, again, have any has any more questions beyond uh, our time to get, uh, to, uh, together today. Um, so I started, uh, I, I joined the uh, Sing Lab at McMaster. So there's some um, uh, members of the Sing Lab here today. Um, but I joined when I was in my third year. Uh, and so that's one of the labs at McMaster. They study, sorry, I'm at home, excuse me, if uh, if there's voices in the back. But um, I started uh, doing uh, glioblastoma research. Uh, there, I was under the supervision of one of the postdoc uh, fellows, uh, and I was uh, learning uh, CAR T cell uh, development. Um, so I did that during my third and my fourth year. Uh, in my third year, I first got exposure to the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada through this competition here, actually, the uh, Pam and Rolando uh, Del Maestro competition. Um, and uh, Dr. Del Maestro and and his, um, you know, wonderful family have been such a supportive um or, or a supportive group and and also just uh, you know providing uh, students uh, with the opportunity to to engage uh, like this has been uh, always very helpful and that was uh, my first exposure uh, so myself and the other uh, undergraduate student had presented uh, back in 2017 a long time ago um, and uh, anyways we participated in that competition following year I participated in that competition uh, as well and I think that was a really great exposure to the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. Uh, along that time, uh, the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada also has summer studentships, which I'm sure uh, many of you are aware of. And so I had sent in an application to work on CAR T cell therapy during my undergrad and was thankfully awarded that. So I stayed with the Sing Lab in my third and my fourth year over the summers um, to yeah keep doing CAR T cell research and uh, for, for glioblastoma, uh, which I really enjoyed. Uh, at the time, I was not sure where next. Uh, I knew I really liked research. Uh, research was something that I had really enjoyed. Uh, but I think I was also, like many people, um, maybe a little bit frustrated with the lack of sometimes applicability to, um, to you know, patient populations. Uh, and so I started gaining an interest in medical school, which many, uh, yeah, I know many people in uh, undergraduate sciences do. Um, it didn't work out for me at the time when I first got up undergrad, and I was fine with that because I was very happy with research. So I started my master's in the Singh Lab at McMaster for two years, uh, kept going with um, CAR T cell research, uh, I was uh, working, excuse me, more closely with uh, patients, which I really uh, enjoyed. But I think, again, I, I, I didn't feel fully um, like uh, the grasp of, of maybe some of my the scientific work. I think I still had some frustrations about that. So I thought I'd give medical school one more go um, after my master's. So I finished my master's and then I started, uh, I, I was, you know, thankfully I, I got in. Um, so I uh, am now at Queens. Uh, brain tumor research has still been something that I really enjoyed. And so I haven't quite let that go. Um, there is a group of uh, neurosurgeons at uh, Queens. Uh, they're for the Queens students here. They may or may not know their name, uh, but uh, it's a husband and wife couple. They do uh, brain tumor research. Uh, they're both neurosurgeons. Uh, they're the prisoners. Uh, and so they just recently opened up a lab. So I helped uh, establish their lab and some of their models just because of how much I enjoyed uh, doing, doing research. And uh, through these years, I've still been in touch uh, with a uh, now, Sue and the lovely team at the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada, who have been really uh, a great uh, avenue uh, of support uh, for me. I've done presentations along the way, such as this one, uh, and I'm always happy to stay involved. Uh, at Queen's, there's also a new initiative. Um, one of my uh, classmates, unfortunately, had uh, been diagnosed with a, uh, with a GBM, uh, and so they started a fundraiser. Uh, the Queen's Med uh, fights uh, cancer, and that's um, and uh, so some of the money they raised uh, went to the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada as well, which was uh, a really nice initiative. So um, I've had the opportunity over the past seven years to stay involved uh, in uh, brain tumor research. Uh, as well as sort of keep a, a close relationship with the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada, who uh, has been an uh, excellent, uh, excellent point of, of support and uh, for for myself, uh, both academic and and just you know socially, uh, but also just a, a great um, 
I, I've gained a lot of uh, experience and exposure uh, through this foundation that I truly am uh, indebted to. So that's sort of been my journey. Uh, now in fourth year, I am in the thick of residency applications and I am applying hopefully for neurosurgery. I'd uh, like to keep going with uh, with brain tumor research and, and brain tumor work. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad uh, that uh, that journey hasn't ended, but uh, definitely uh, the BTFC was uh, some of the earliest exposure that I got in it, and I hope to keep uh, working with them. So that is my journey. Uh, I obviously wish you all the best on yours. I'm also happy to answer any questions if anybody happens to have. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's been quite a fast and uh, exciting seven years. Thank you so much, Sabra. Um, I think that um, the way we've kind of developed our research program for um, awards and, and funding opportunities um, is to um, show kind of the progression that Sabra um, has gone through. So I wanted to um, have her present um, for all of you um, who might be deciding kind of where, where you're going from here. Um, so Sabra came in um, doing the exact same presentation that you guys all did today. Um, and then as she indicated, she applied for a studentship. Um, she then worked in a lab that had other awards that um, that we had provided for work that she was doing um, and has progressed on. So um, we hope as um, Sabra gets more established and um, moves forward and continues to do amazing things um, that we'll see her name, you know, applying for other opportunities as she's eligible to to do so. So um, I didn't know whether or not anyone had any questions for um, Sabra. Um, or to um, ask her anything about um, her experience or um, where she's at now or how she she got to the point that she is that uh, that she didn't already share. So any questions at all, please feel free to unmute um, yourselves and um, just ask the question aloud. The quiet crowd. <laughs> waiting in anticipation for the results. I know. <laughs> I'll tell you. Well, so, uh, you know, Pam and I very much, hi, how are you doing? <laughs> Good, how about yourself? <laughs> I'm, doing, I'm doing well. Pam and I very, very much enjoyed your uh, your presentation. Um, you. you know, it, it's interesting to think that you you started in, uh, in, 19, or in, uh, in 2017, which I think was the first year in which it, we had the actual uh, competition. I think that's true. So that means we, the competition has been going for about eight years, which is rather amazing to think about that. And with with thirteen people applying this year and twelve, you know, getting to the final group, that's sort of a you know quite an impressive sort of uh, you know interaction with with the medical um, with the various students that are involved in pre pre medicine. Let me put it that way at the present time. Now, tell me now, you you actually work with with um, a neurosurgeons uh, at um, at uh, the University of New Master and also now at uh, Queens. Mm -hmm. um, tell me why you think about neurosurgery. I mean, neurosurgery is not exactly an easy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so of, uh, I've been told. I know. I think that's a really uh, great question. Um. So I actually tried not to like it. <laughs> um, <laughs> when I started med like medical school, you know, I had a lot of exposure just because of who I was working with, and I didn't want to. Uh, if typecast is the word, I didn't want to typecast myself or, you know, hone in uh, on, on that because I know, you know, it's a difficult uh, lifestyle or it can be a difficult lifestyle. It can be a difficult specialty. Certainly the presentations aren't always uh, yeah, the most forgiving. Uh, but I think as I started, I just, I haven't been able to let brain tumor research go, but, you know, uh, the question would be then why, why neurosurgery? Because it's one sort of at one window um, of, you know, say a patient's like brain tumor journey. And I think it came down simply to the fact that I really love working with my hands. Um, and while like, I, you know, I enjoy neuro oncology a lot, uh, being able to actually treat somebody uh, with my hands, uh, like, on, you know, for, so for example, in the, in, in the, you know, for a brain tumor patient, um, be, being able to do that, I think is something that I, 
I, I value uh, certainly very, very much. And um, so being able to do that and then actually learning about it and practicing it and being able to be involved in ORs, I think for me, those were just uh, very uh, profound experiences. So I really love the procedures uh, and and being able to be involved in, in brain tumor care uh, in that capacity. But neurosurgery isn't also just uh, brain tumors. Neurosurgery is quite broad. And, and I think I've definitely grown um, uh a, a huge appreciation and excitement for, um, you know, some of the other co uh, the other clinical presentations. I like the acuity, um, how, you know, sort of fast paced it is, how academic it is. So uh, there's a lot of different reasons why I think I've come to it. I really wish I didn't like it, but it's because <laughs> maybe I'd have a, a life that I can sleep, you know, uh, sleep uh, decent hours, but uh, it's definitely been a, been a strong pull. So we'll see how it goes. So the rest of you students who are listening, you see you've fallen into this, she's fallen into our trap. Our trap was to have these this competition to get you students as undergraduates to try to show you that uh, brain tumors are an interesting and very important field. So here's an example of someone who happily- Yeah, trapped, trap. happily trapped. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're grateful Thank that you. you've come this far and we wish you all the best. I sincerely appreciate that. And it's definitely, you know, thanks to initiatives like this, that, uh, 